Hello, everybody. This is Zero Limits Living. I'm Dr. Joe Vitale. Every week, I bring you inspiration and information to help make your dreams come true. And this week, we're going to focus entirely on your dreams because I have a specialist in making dreams come true. I have an expert. I have a person here who has written best-selling books, who has been doing this for 50 years, who is a friend of mine, and I'm going to pick her brains for you. And in fact, one of her biggest dreams is to make one billion dreams come true, which would include you. So what is your dream? How do you make it come true? How do you make all of this work? We're going to find it out on this episode of Zero Limits Living. So let me introduce her. I got to put my glasses on to do this. Mary Morrissey has made it her mission to empower people to create and live a life they love. For over 50 years, Mary has studied the art and science of transforming dreams into results. Mary is the founder of the Brave Thinking Institute, the world's premier provider of transformational training and coaching. Through life-changing books, events, and programs, Mary has helped millions of people tap into the power within them to achieve new levels of success and experience a deeper sense of meaning and purpose. Mary holds a master's degree in counseling psychology and an honorary doctorate in humane letters. She has addressed the United Nations three times, co-convened three week-long meetings with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and met with President Nelson Mandela in South Africa. She has written two best-selling books, No Less Than Greatness and Building Your Field of Dreams, and the latter was turned into a PBS special. And as I mentioned, Mary is focused on a bold dream of her own. She wants one billion dreams achieved around the world, and that dream begins with you. Mary, how are you? I'm great, Joe. It's so nice to be with you. It's great great to see you again. You are as radiant as ever. Are you plugged into something in particular? Why are you so luminous? Well, thank you. Well, I love my life. I mean, that... That energy has a lot of life-giving, you know. That'll do it. it. Yep. That'll do it. Sure. Well, you look like you're plugged into life and you're living the dream there. I actually pulled up one of your books that was not mentioned in your bio. That's uh, The Miracle Minute. And I was looking at it earlier going, wow, this is practical wisdom to inspire your day. And I'm totally loving it. And we can talk about it and your other books at some point. But the thing that jumped out, the very back of the book, and I didn't know this about you. You have two black belts, one in success and one in failure. Yes, I do. (laughs) Would you like to talk about that? Because I'd like to know, and I think we need to start at ground zero and find out maybe what's the black belt in failure. Yeah, I'd be happy to tell you. I'd I'd love to start that story by even having just a short amount of time to share how I even got into transformation. I would Um, love to know that. That's one of my questions anyway. So you're leaping ahead. Yeah, I'll start there because it started really when I was quite young. I was, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, uh, was in high school, had a high school experience like, and a family. I had a great family, mom and dad and a sister who was eight years older. I'm in high school now, um, a junior in high school, class vice president. I'm on the drill team, have a lead in the junior play, and I'm a homecoming princess, all things young girls love having in their lives. My high school boyfriend and I had waited four years. He went off to college, came home on spring break of that year. I got pregnant May 1. I'm telling my mom and dad I'm now pregnant. My mother wept for me as if I were dying. Um, (laughs) All her dreams for me were dying. Uh, And we had a very hasty 10-person wedding. And then a couple of weeks later, the principal of the high school called me to his office and he said, Mary, are these rumors I'm hearing about you true? I said, well, if the rumors are that I'm pregnant and married in that order, then yes, they're true. And he just put his head in his hands and he says, Mary, you have great honors and terrific grades, but you will not be allowed to return here for your senior year. It would be totally inappropriate for a pregnant girl to get mixed in with the normal girls. Wow. But if you want to get a high school, high school diploma, which I did because I, I had dreamed always of being a teacher and I didn't see, I saw getting pregnant and having a baby as a detour, but not a dead end to that dream. So yes, I wanted a high school diploma. So he said, if you want to get a high school diploma, and he told me where it was, it was across the river, actually in a part of, and it wasn't during the day, it was at night after the normal kids came and went from school. It was where the pregnant girls and the delinquent boys went to high school. 
And that was my new student body that next fall when I drove there and kind of walked Amazing. those steps. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in December. I graduated in May of that year. And then in July of that year, Joe, I'm in an intensive care ward in a Portland hospital, having been diagnosed with fatal kidney disease. This is 1967. We don't have dialysis or transplants. And, and you're at what age? This is. I'm 18. I have a seven month old son. And I'm told that if we can get the blood toxin level in my body reduced enough so I can sustain a surgery to remove my right kidney, then maybe I'll have six months to live. I'm Good terrified. Lord. I had no idea. I never heard this story before. That's a, this is a shock to the system. I can't even imagine what you were going through. Oh, I was terrified. I also deep down had a feeling that I was being punished. The God of my <laughs> bringing was an angry, punishing God. And I just felt, well, clearly I'm a bad girl. I got kicked out of school. My, my, I'm not, I'm not, can't be with the normal kids. I'm, mm. um, you know, it was like Scarlet Letter. The, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, so I, this is my belief system at the time. Finally, the night before the surgery was scheduled, a woman walked in my room, identifying herself as a chaplain who was offering prayer for people. She said, I get the list of those having surgeries, serious surgeries tomorrow. Your name's at the top of my list. Would you like somebody to pray with you? I was scared and I said, okay. She did not do anything that looked like or ever was like typical prayer. She pulled her chair next to my bed and she asked me, would you be willing to tell me what's been going on in your life the last year or two? Oh. So I shared my story with her at the end of which she looked at me, Joe, and she was very compassionate. She looked at me and she says, Mary, everything's created twice. I had zero. I mean, it was just like <laughs> today I would say I had no landing uh, page for right. that. <laughs> uh, what, and, I, and then I got this quizzical look obviously on my face and she says you know this everybody knows this almost nobody knows the power of knowing this the bed mm. you're laying on the nightgown you're wearing the sheets covering you the walls the ceiling the floor all the machinery you're hooked up to first it had to be a thought before it could ever be a thing and now that you're considering how everything is created twice could you consider the possibility she said, I hear how much you love your little boy, but I also hear how much you've been hating yourself. You mm. feel like you shamed your school, you shamed your family, you shamed yourself. And now that you're considering how everything is created twice, could you consider the possibility that all that toxic thinking could have something to do with the toxicity that's rampaging your body and threatening your very life? Well, nobody I knew thought this way. This is this right. is 1967. This is before yeah. there were mind body clinics at Harvard and Stanford and UCLA and many, many mm -hmm. other teaching medical centers. Uh, we never talked about how thoughts impact our, our physical results mm -hmm. uh, and, and emotions. So anyway, she said, um, if you could live, what would you do? And I told her I would raise my little boy and I would become a teacher. And then she gave me a pattern of thinking to follow. I wouldn't have called it then. She just, it was like a prescription. She says, here's what I want you to do. She says, if you keep thinking those toxic thoughts, you're going to keep having toxicity in your body. We got to change that. In the morning, they're going to take that one kidney out. I'm going to do a visualization. I've never even heard of visualization. I'm going to do a visualization with you. And we're going to imagine that we're scooping up all the toxicity that's in your system and putting it in that one kidney that's going to get removed. And when it gets removed, we're going to imagine that it's gone. You're going to have some pain when you wake up from the surgery. As that ebbs, your mind is going to want to go down the well-worn paths of mm. thinking you've been doing. Mm. So the moment you notice that you are having a self-loathing thought, interrupt it and say, nope, that left with the kidney. And then you got to replace it. You can't just interrupt a pattern. you got to replace it. So then... Interrupt it, say, no, that left with the kidney. And then immediately, because she, I, you know, what would you do if you could live? You would, I would raise my little boy. I would become a teacher. She said, so then I want you to immediately interrupt it. And then imagine you're walking into a kindergarten a school. There's a kindergarten teacher standing out, out, out. You go up the steps and there's a kindergarten uh, teacher. And you have this little boy's hand in yours. Feel the warmth of his hand. He's five years old. And you're walking your little boy into kindergarten. And... You hear the click, click, click of your heels around the corner and there's your classroom. Then fast forward in your mind and you're sitting at a stadium or a big auditorium and there's caps and gowns all over the, all over the stage and you hear your son's name called and this is his high school graduation. 
He comes up to the stage, he gets his diploma, he waving his, waving his head and you're cheering and, and so happy for him and all the moments that you've been involved in his life to help him achieve this goal. Then fast forward in your mind and you're sitting in the front row of a wedding and it's your son's wedding, he's marrying the love of his life and you're the mother of the groom and your teaching career is flourishing. So it was beginning in the first image, it was growing in the second image, my teaching career, and it was flourishing in this last image. And she said, just keep repeating that. Then she left and it was, um, they took me to surgery the next day. Uh, the, 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 the surgeon told my, my parents and, and my husband, um, that one kidney is totally destroyed. The other kidney is 50% destroyed. It's got pock marks, it's shriveled. We don't even know if she'll get six months. But my numbers began to stabilize within a week or so, instead of decreasing or increasing in, in the toxicity, they were stabilizing. After two weeks, they said, well, maybe you're gonna need a little more time than we thought. If you wanna go home for a while before you have to come back to the hospital, I went home in an ambulance, I was so weak. I didn't know, today we would call what I did then, that I was an um, unconscious competent. I did the process, but I wasn't aware, oh, maybe this will make me better. There was no awareness on it. I, but I did the thing and it did change, obviously my vibration because within five months, my numbers, I had to go multiple times a week to get checked with my numbers, but the numbers over time, not only stabilized, but they started getting a little better and a little better and a little better. And about five months after the surgery, I'm sitting in the conference room at the hospital with the surgeon and the urologist and the different specialists. And they're shaking their heads saying, we have no science for what's happening with you. And the surgeon said, I saw that kidney. It was shriveled and pockmarked, and, um, but now it's functioning as a whole perfect kidney. And we have no idea how long this will last or even if it will last. And again, I was unconscious to the pattern, but what had happened is I had a vision. Now she gave me a vision of raising my little boy and becoming a teacher. And I was working with that evidently enough that it changed the vibration in my body and my body began to instead of having this self-loathing, decreasing, contractive feeding of this energy to my body, my body was now being fed with a new version of life. And then this, I is a, this is a remarkable story on so many different levels. I'm curious, did you ever get to see the person who had uh, prayed with you and talked to you? Many years later, the, I was 18 at this point. Uh, I would, I would, I, I, then I went back, I call it back to sleep. I had no interest in transformation. I was just glad. <laughs> well, but in my twenties, as uh, I got into undergraduate school when I was 21 and uh, within a few months, there were certain things happening and a whole series of things occurred in October of 1971. Uh, and I got very interested in transformation. I had some personal experiences and I went, Oh, Life is not happening to me. Life is happening with me. Mm. And my thoughts and my vibration are a part of what can be and not be in my life. And I began to study everything I could find in that field from philosophy and all the world's religions and science, got a master's degree in counseling psychology. So I went at it from many different perspectives and why I was able to meet Rosa Parks and Nelson Mandela and work with the Dalai Lama and have conversations with them as I traveled the world being highly interested in how did you transform? What do you do with your mm -hmm. mind? What, is the, what are the tools or the ways in which you have brought transformation? And it, it was highly instructive. And over time, uh, I began to teach it. So about 12 years, 13, 14 years from when I, she was at my bedside, and I was doing the version of transformation that I knew to do at that time, which the only way I saw to teach this was through a church, through uh, mm -hmm. a form of, uh, we didn't have the personal development mm -hmm. uh, work in the early 70s. So, uh, so I be a very uh, open-minded, non-denominational, all religions and all people accepted uh, work that I began. It was very small when she walked in the door. And he came up and introduced herself to me and that she'd heard about me. And she said, do you remember when I came to your bedside? And then I, I was like, oh my gosh. Wow. And I thanked her for whatever study she had done to be the only person that I had ever known who could do what she did with me, that 18 year old girl who was scared and terrified. And had she not intervened in what was going on inside of me, it was almost predictable that I would not be here.
That is a remarkable story. And that woman was an angel in flesh form for you, coming with a message that you took heed, you heard it, and you acted on it, which is one of the essential ingredients to making a dream come true. But I'm fascinated. Is this part of how you get your black belt in failure or in success? (laughs) That's the one that helped me get success. So, (laughs) you know, how you get a black belt in failure is everybody has certain failures. My failure was a much more public Um, I was married to my kid's dad. We ended up having four children together. We Mm -hmm. were together 27 years in my early 40s. uh, I never saw that marriage as a failure. I mean, we were together last weekend with our kids. He's a wonderful guy. We were just kids when we got married and we weren't on the same wavelength for many, many years, but we loved our kids and we did a good job raising them. And we freed each other in midlife. He's very happy in his world and I'm happy in mine. But then in my mid forties, I met and married a man who was a CPA and came in and uh, my work had grown and grown by then. And I was, uh, you know, traveling the world and doing things. And he uh, was a business guy and he helped the board and this and that. I knew he had depression disorder when I married him, but I had no idea the the dimension of the mental illness that he would bring into not only my life, but the work. And by the time I discovered what had happened with money, the board and I'd been operating on the financials that we were handed, um, there was over a million dollars missing. And once you lose, I had to tell the congregation about that. And once you lose faith um, and the newspapers got a hold of it and it was not Mm. mental illness causes manic decisions. It wasn't that at all that the newspaper wrote about. It was um, another whole version of it about, Mm -hmm. you know, the minister trying to, you know, do things. And it Uh was very, very challenging for me because this is the paper I'd grown up in the state I grew up in where Uh I'd been on the front page with the Dalai Lama. I'd been on the front page at the UN. I'd been on, you know, on the front page with many different things. And now I'm on the front page as one of the headlines was profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T for profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. Wow. And and I remember, I remember Joe one day just feeling, oh, and looking out the window of the house, I was, I had raised kids there. Um, he was now in a mental institution. My work was dying and pretty soon we'd, we'd be told we'd have to close it. The board and I would resign and the leaders I had raised would establish new churches out of that. Um, and I, I was so disturbed by what they were printing. And then the thought occurred to me, you know what, Mary, it really doesn't matter what they say, you know the truth. And you can stand on the truth. You know what you thought. You know the decisions you made you thought were in the right for the congregants you served. The board knew that. The board and I stood strong together. And eventually, uh, I knew I couldn't stay married to him because he had the capacity, even as it was coming down. And I would ask, you know, he, he would look me in the eye and not tell me the truth and find lots of different stories he told me. So I knew I couldn't stay married to him. Um, and the board and I, um, it did what we were told was the most ethical thing to do, and that was to resign and let uh, others take it over and create a new church out of that. And that's what happened. But it was a very public um, yeah. smash flat belly flop. And the next Sunday, after <clears throat> 20, 23 or four years of getting up every Sunday morning at three to deliver a message, and we had thousands of people coming every Sunday, there was no place to go. Wow. And Wow. I got up to watch the last sermon. It was being broadcast all over the Northwest. I watched the last sermon and I, I was very just tortured at what had happened, but I was very proud of myself for how I uh, certainly gave that last message and how I did what I had to do at the moment it was given to me. And then I went to the Oregon coast. I thought to walk for a day. And after I was down there, I thought one day is not going to do it. And I ended up staying at the Oregon coast for 90 days, walking the beach every single day. And the first five weeks, I was just bereft. Mm. Uh, I was, um, I was mad. I was mad at him. I was mad at some of the, like the other CPA was supposed to be watching over this. I was at the end, I was mad at myself because upon hindsight, I could see things that I couldn't mm. noticed, but didn't. And, um, And I think deep down, I came to the place of where I realized I was, as a public person, I was more afraid of a second divorce than seeing the truth. And that was a very, very expensive fear to let run my life. So 
that was then, you know, I couldn't do anything about that. I'm just feeling now what? And then it dawned on me about five weeks into it. I still loved helping people. That's, that's what I had done all these years. I had devoted my life to that. And I still loved that. I didn't know the form that I, that the next version of my work would take. Um, but I knew that the old life was gone, the new life had not yet emerged, and that I needed to make peace with what had happened as best I could. And there was, as it all came down, the congregants had bought this 100 acre piece of land and a thousand, 100,000 square foot facility and a retreat center on congregant shared debt. And there was uh, approximately $10 million owing. And it was all gonna get bankrupt. And I knew spiritually that I either, that the congregants didn't just trust the church, they trusted me. And I trusted him. They didn't pick him, I did. And that I needed to be responsible for that. Now I had no job. I had, at this point, my reputation is in the tank. And I'm thinking, I have no idea how I will ever pay this back. But you're talking today about zero limits living. Mm -hmm. And I did have a relationship with, the spiritual part of my nature to know that inside every one of us is more power and more potential than any circumstance, situation, or condition. Uh, that that power in me, when I partnered with it at a higher level of vibration, the disease evaporated. And I didn't have any idea how this could be done, but I thought, I'm not going to bankrupt. I'm going to promise to pay those congregants back. I have zero idea how to do it. I will either get it done in my lifetime or I will die having attempted. And once I made that decision, I felt at peace about it. Like, okay. Uh, and then a series of things occurred, which so that was now my dream. My dream mm -hmm. was to do such good work that I was able then to bring that to a zero balance and do such good work. And I had friends like Wayne Dyer, I mean, many longtime friends, Wayne Dyer and um, Les Brown and Bob Proctor, Michael Beckwith and you and all, all kinds of people who brought me to their stages and helped me understand how to move from nonprofit work to profit making work so mm. I could fulfill my dream. And I used all the principles of transformation that in the beginning, and this is for any of us who want to break through something, I, you know, I saw that debt is big. And as long as I see the debt is big, that makes Mary and her God or Mary and her higher power, what? Little. So I had to get it, get it right in my mindset. That this, these are just zeros. You know, I would say stuff to myself like this. And I did the same process I train others in, in dream building on myself. And I began to build a work. And that work grew. Now, it took me 14 years to bring that to zero balance. But I got that to zero balance. But you did it. But I you did it. did it. Larry, you're so inspiring. Let me let me interrupt. Those are my two black belts. <laughs> You've earned them. <laughs> you have earned them. And those are remarkable black belts and amazing stories. You told them so well. I couldn't help but notice the teaching lessons within the stories themselves that everybody watching or listening can actually apply. And there's a couple things though I got to ask you about because I think they're going to be on the people's minds and I I need to play like I'm the agent for everybody watching and try to pretend I know what's on their mind and what they would ask you if they had the chance. So in both of those situations there was a time when you had to forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. And then we both know in transformation work, forgiveness is a very big thing. It's a turning point, actually, when you get to flip that and you can forgive yourself and or other people, you can actually move forward at warp speed and get things done. So my question is, how did you forgive yourself? In well, the first see. one in the hospital, when the woman is, comes to you who's going to pray, but she does the explanation with you, she's kind of walking you through that. Uh, can you give us a different... The second one was much more challenging, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, because so many people were involved. In, yes. And it, you know, ultimately I came to realize, so the word for forgiveness, so we all have a perception about something that, that you, you can't not have a perception about what an event or a circumstance means. I had to evolve that from this shouldn't have happened to it did happen. I should have seen it. I didn't. Um, that was a mistake of leadership. 
There was no doubt about that. So I had to accept what happened, but also know that I could make a mistake without being a mistake. That there mm. was a part of me that was more, and I would certainly, I would, I was much more informed about leadership and than I was in that, in that stage of my, my work. Um, and I took responsibility. If we've been part of a mistake and there's a way to take responsibility for it and do your best, there are certain things you can't clean up. I mean, you can't make it different. Something happens, you wish you could go back and change it and you can't change it. But if there's anything you can do to make it better, that actually helps, whether it's you, you barked at your child mm -hmm. and you, you realize that was a mistake or an error in how, your parenting, how you wanna be seen and, and act as a parent. So you go to your child and say, you know, I'm sorry I spoke to you with that tone of voice. But here's, here's, here's what's going on. And you, it's, it's, there's a way of, you know, we, we, this, this universe, this dimension called time and space, it, it operates through polarity, through contrast. Mm. So up and down, in and out, all of this. So we learn by making mistakes. We learn to walk by falling down. Mm. We learn to be better leaders by having moments when we weren't a great leader. So the mistake is not the real issue. The Whether you, we keep doing them or, or seek to make the source of mistake in outside circumstances or other people. I believe... Mm. If once I took 100% responsibility for the experience I had and sought to do what I could to change what I could change, I spent three years working with congregants, helping them transform. And uh, it, was, it was a huge, huge opportunity for me. Uh, so I'm so much more able actually to help those who come to the trainings I do, Joe, and um, find a way to navigate the stories in their life that they continue to tell themselves that leave them feeling less than actually who they really are. Mm. So forgiveness is to give for one perception a much more expansive and life-giving perception. So we can have a mistake and we have, can have made a mistake without being a mistake. That is a great distinction right there. The other thing that came up is the idea of knowing what you want. Mm -hmm. And going back to your original story with the woman who came to you in the hospital before your surgery, she guided you into visualizing what you would do and what you would um, and what you can visualize having happen to you with your child. What about somebody watching right now? They're not they don't have that clarity. You know, we're talking about dreams and you want to make one billion dreams come true. And one of the first things everybody needs to know is what's my dream? And one of the things I've heard a lot, and you've probably heard it is, I don't know what I want. I don't know my dream. I don't know what to go for. I don't know my intention. How in would trainings, you? In the trainings I do, I would say 50, 60% of the people come to the training having their, that's right where they are. Hmm. It is that they don't know their dream. It's that they haven't had the support to unlock it. Yeah. So yeah. we do a series of questions and here's how I, I do know that it works. Mm -hmm. Is that when I say you do know, it's just that you, you, life is so busy and you've got, we tend to live by dealing with what's coming at us that we don't have the support to really pay attention to what's seeking to come from us or emerge mm -hmm. through us. So that's why what you do in the world, Joe, and coming to this program weekly can help you take up just a respite from everything coming at you. And you can start to pay attention to what's seeking to come from you. Mm -hmm. We are more than we appear to be. Not one of us created ourselves. We can't breathe ourselves on our own power. We can't make our heart beat one time by ourselves. There's something happening with us. It's this thing called life. It's animating us. When life leaves this body, it's just a clump of clay. It collapses in its inert self. We are that life. And, and life is, here's the deal about life. All you have to do is look at it and know that it is, we're in a spiral universe. In a spiral universe, there's an ever upward pull to becoming. That's true about a blade of grass. It'll uh, stretch right through cement seeking the light. Uh -huh. okay. Life is pressing through the edges of a tree. Life is pressing through you and me today to experience mm. more of who we can be and more of what we can be and do and have and give. Hmm. Now we can stomp that down. The difference between a tree or a blade of grass is they, uh, that form of life has no will to resist yeah. life. Yeah. 
in the human species, we can resist it. We can say, not now, it's not convenient, or who do I think I am, or all kinds mm -hmm. of ways that we shut down the urge towards more life. Mm -hmm. But if we will just pay attention, we can begin to dream and we can notice two things. You have four major areas where you have results right now, all of us. We have results in our health. Right now we have results. We have results in our current level of relationships, whether we're fulfilled, whether this is an area of, of sadness or just a disconnection or discord. We have a certain amount of health, health results and a certain amount right now of relationship results. And we have what we're doing with our vocation, whether we earn income doing it or not, we are doing something with our time and talent. Is it fulfilling? Are you having to check your soul at the door when you go in and trade your time for money? What, how fulfilled are you in that area? And including time is a freedom quadrant, time freedom, money freedom. And what we, none of us want to be wealthy in, in work, in our vocation and bankrupt in our relationship with our kids or spouse. Mm -hmm or bankrupt in our health because we're working 90 hours a week or 80 and we're, and we're so stressed out to earn that income and thinking we're doing it for everybody else, you can have full spectrum wealth. You can be wealthy in all of those areas, but not without a vision for what mm. that would be for you. What would you really be doing? So here's what I believe that that power that's breathing us sends us signals through two wavelengths. Every single day it's sending them. Now we can ignore them or we can notice what we're noticing and notice longing. So thoughts will come to you like, oh, I just wish I could, what? Mm -hmm. I wish I could take my kids here. I wish I could pay for my grandkids' education. I wish I could, what is it you would love? It, it goes, it speaks to you through longing. It also speaks to you through, through discontent. Oh, I'm so frustrated with working this many hours. I just, mm. I just, I, I don't, I never like it at the end of the month where I'm trying to squeeze everything together and pay the bills with this amount of money or longing and discontent is life saying you were meant for more. You don't have to keep operating at the same vibration. You can change that. And when you change that in the same way, she helped me change my vibration my health was on a different vibration. That illness did not exist on a life-giving vibration. It had list, it existed on a life-diminishing vibration, self-loathing, mm. feeling bad about myself, feeling embarrassed. Mm. All of those energies, well rehearsed, created mm. a result. And the, the vibration we tend to live in, not just a now and then thought, but the patterns are the key to our results. We know it with our television. When you turn on your television, the picture you're seeing is an exact match to the frequency you're tuned to. Mm. If you want a different program, you got to change the frequency. You don't go to the TV and try to change what's the pictures on the TV mm -hmm. or a movie. You never go to the screen of a movie. You go to the projection booth and mm. change the film. Mm -hmm. And so as we begin to understand having a clear vision, but that's only a piece of it. Lots of people have a dream. Right. Very few people understand what dream building is. And it has three phases. There's the vision or the blueprint for a life you would absolutely love living. It, I, we want to learn to ask the question, what would I love? Not what do I think I can do? What is the economy? Now we're in an inflationary time. I mean, we better be careful here. No, think about what you would love. Let that dictate at least the vision. Once you have the vision, then there's a process by which you have to move to and come from that vibration. And the third part is you take action steps that are from the ideas that are on the vibration of your vision. Now, it sounds perhaps a little complicated, but actually what happens is it's very simple. It's very simple. It does take, you know, some Yeah, I, this is remarkable. I mean, I'm getting a class in creating and making dreams come true right here. And I know that you have a free gift that we want to make sure everybody gets towards the end here, a free master class with you. So I'll be giving out that link. Uh, the technician, Nick, will put it up on the screen for people to see as we go on. Uh, one of the things I hear from a lot of people, even if they know what they want and they can state their dream is, they'll shrug and say, but I don't know how. Mm -hmm. they'll move into I need and then just fill in the blank usually they'll say I need the money and then one of their dreams is I want to win the lottery um, how do you address the and you did in part with your three-part formula there but I'd like you to stretch it out a little bit and unpack it how do you handle the I got my dream in my mind and I can visualize it 
but I don't know how to get there. Of course we don't. If we knew we'd be there, of course we don't know how. <laughs> and actually, it's not our business. Mm. We're dealing with a mind that is infinite, mm. and an intelligence that is infinite. When And we know this through quantum physics. So when you dream a dream, you create a quantum in the quantum field. It has a vibration to it. Actually, when you really do a well-designed dream, it exists not at the frequency of form yet, but it exists as surely as the life I'm looking at right now exists. It's just vibrating at a different rate. As I tune to that frequency and start being the person who's living that life in the way I can, mm. or as Henry David Thoreau said, if one advances confidently in the direction of their dream, you can't move in a direction you haven't dreamed up. But once you dream it up, if one advances confidently in the direction of their dream, not trying to get to the dream, it's impossible. Scientifically, it's impossible. Endeavoring to live the life you've imagined. There are certain things you can do right now with what you have from where you are to put yourself in the vibration of being the person living that life. And what happens is all your answers are on the frequency of you being that person. The answers to where you, to having the life you have right now are on the frequency of your major dominant way of thinking. So we have to change that. And there's systems for doing that. And it actually turns out to be quite easy if you know how. So that's why you're teaching. That's why you do such a magnificent job helping people oh. do that, Joe. I mean, it's, it's, that's, well, I respect you so much. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate it coming from you. That is a huge compliment here. I know in books of yours, like The Miracle Minute, which is a wonderful book for just opening up and getting a minute's worth of inspiration, but I had opened it up several times today just to see what was happening and what I would come across. And one of them was on gratitude. And gratitude is one of those pivot point um techniques if you want to call it a technique it's like forgiveness because when you do the forgiveness my god life changes but i also know what happens with gratitude what's the magic of gratitude especially when it comes to making our dreams come true mm -hmm. there's layers of gratitude most of mm -hmm. us have been trained in what i call a knee-jerk gratitude mm -hmm. is that we have to have something that stimulates gratitude in us there's a different kind of gratitude, and I believe that's what you're talking about. I, yes. call, it, I call it generative gratitude, uh, where if you have to have something to be grateful for, just simply be grateful for life. Mm. That uh, I, I, I have been given life's greatest gift today, and that's a day of life. Mm. Uh, and then there's a vibration to it. Uh, I have a practice that I've had for many, many years. Once I realized that gratitude is the frequency that's harmonious with abundance, so all of us who want more of anything in our lives, we can't be in a state of, oh, like, you know, it coming from lack and expecting more. We have to move to a gratitude and we have to generate more gratitude because that's the frequency that's harmonious with abundance. And different ideas come to us when we're operating from gratitude. Mm. Ideas are the infinite or the universe's first currency is an idea. We call it an aha or inspiration. Only if we act on it, does it actually close the circuit and then begin to generate a different result. So I have a practice that I do every single morning and it took a while to um, have it be my go-to thing. In the morning when I realize that I'm waking up, whether it's um, you know, our dog jumps on our bed or the right. sun or my alarm. <laughs> uh, and I, I have that moment of knowing I'm coming to I cause myself at that moment to go, oh, I'm being given life's greatest gift today, a day of life. This day has never happened before, not in eternity. And this day will never happen again, not in eternity. Nobody gets to think my thoughts today but me, choose my actions today but me, make important today what I make important. Uh, and I just generate this state of what I call radical gratitude at being given a day of life. And then I have other practices I proceed through as I go through my day but that's, that's something I return to numerous times in the day that uh -huh. here I am I'm, I'm in this because here's the deal not everybody woke up today right not everybody does get to wake up and you and I are both old enough to have many friends and different people we've loved 
Uh, and some stay a long time, some stay very short amounts of time. And none of us know for sure there's an invisible date for every single one of us. So the only thing we know for sure that we have is this, is here and now. And to make the most of it, having a dream, having, having a life you would absolutely love. It's not only having that life that ultimately matters, it's because as you grow, so you are that life, it's who you become in the process that's the real gift. And that's with you forever. Mm. What I'd like to hear, and I think it would inspire people, is a story or two of somebody who's gone through your work and achieved the dream. Could be a noteworthy dream, could be big, could be small, but as particularly if it's a average person next door who hears about you, attends your classes, reads your books, and goes through your material and ends up doing something that the rest of us are marveling at. Do you have a favorite story or two? Gosh, so I'm, I bet. <laughs> I'm going to drag you and privilege to work with people all over the world. Yeah. Uh, th there's two that popped into my mind when you asked okay. the question. So I'll share. First one is a woman named Kelly, a uh, professor in Minnesota, who developed uh, <clears throat> two little kids um, working lots of hours as a professor and developed a immune disorder. And I met Kelly. She found me on the web and started coming to, you know, trainings, virtual trainings. But I met her. Um, she found me through the web um, at a moment in her life where this immune disorder had gotten so painful that she was on uh, leave of absence from her professorship. She had a, a child six and a child eight. And she's laying on a couch looking out the window and the snow's happening and her children are out there with her husband building a snowman and she doesn't have the strength, the energy to get off the couch and she's in pain. And that had become the normal of her life, living mm. this way. Mm. And she wants so much to be involved in her children's life and to do her work. And she heard my story and she had no idea how to do it, but she got involved with some of the trainings and she started just implementing the simple and easy to repeat practices and things just like with me. It didn't happen overnight, but the, the trend that took her there, we shifted that trend and the thinking that went with it and mm. the practices that went with that thinking and the actions that she was taking just, and baby steps are great. Baby steps will take you all the way up Mount Everest if you just keep taking them. <laughs> and here's Kelly, within, within a year, Kelly, was already so, so much better that she enrolled in part-time work after six years of not working. Mm. She got part-time work. And now she's mm. fully, fully, I mean, it's a thing of the past. Yes, they say she still has it, but it's gone dormant. And they right. say, we don't know how long this will last. We don't know if it will last, just like the physicians told me. But Kelly's had it probably seven or eight years now, a full- Oh, full that's thing. amazing. That's yeah. wonderful. Jeez. And it's a health transformation. Yeah transformation of all kinds <clears throat> is done exactly the same. Uh, here's a vocational transformation. A woman came to one of my events, found me on the web. Um, she knew she needed to do something. She was a highly sought after banking attorney with one of the largest banks in the United States, traveling, working with the executives, making sure compliance was done, all kinds of things. And she was highly paid and highly um, sought after, but she was working 80 hours a week on average, on average. Mm. So all the rest of the portions of her life were anemic. And her uh, favorite aunt, who was more like a mother to her, was dying. And because Katie had been traveling and working so hard, she had a, a really horrible cold and they wouldn't let her come and say goodbye because she was sick and they, you know, the grandmother was, or the aunt was dying, but she couldn't go. Mm. And she missed that moment. And, and she was also showing signs of stress with her losing some hair and her teeth and different things. But she, the only, in her profession, the only people who stopped or, or got it to be different, they, she said it was like being on this hamster wheel and you either flung off or you had an accident or you got sick or something. And she didn't see any way to change it. So she came, she enrolled and over time. So Katie had a dream. Her dream was she would love to help the banks that she had helped, but she wanted to work 50%. She wanted to mainly work from home. And um, she thought she would, she said, maybe I can even, maybe I could even make 50% of what I've been making. I probably get by on that. I said, Katie, why would you want to settle for 50%? What if you could work 50%, work 30 hours, like 30 hours a week, less than 50% right. of what she was doing, 
work from home, do some travel as you choose, uh, influence and impact in the world you care about. And what if you could earn the same income? Oh, nobody can do that. No, nobody. And this is something people tend to think. Well, nobody's ever done that. I mean, this would nobody in my career field has that. I said, what does that have to do with what you want? What other people have had? Look to what you want, not what the status quo is. And that's what my mentor trained me in. I was very much the person who looked around me to see what was possible instead right. of within me. And um, and West Lane, Wayne Dyer and Les Brown and I had the privilege of working with this man, Jack Bowen, for five years. Oh, he trained yeah. all of us in this. So anyway, so here's, <laughs> let me tell you about Katie today. Within about 18 to 24 months of her coming for the first time, uh, Katie was shifting her hours. She was uh, working with, and she decided she would just start imagining that she got a phone call from some banking person that she had known. Uh, she'd know who it would be or where it would be from, who was saying that we want you. Because she would get offers because of her how well known she was in the banking field. But this would be an offer where she could say, but I want to work from home and that it would be accepted. And she was still in her mind thinking she was going to have to work for less. And then when the, the call came, we want you to do this. She says, well, I'm, I'm willing to work 30 hours a week. I want to work. She, had, she said she felt this glitch in her throat. Can I actually say, I want to work, I want to work from home. She says, well, I would love mainly to work from home. I'll do this amount of traveling and I want to earn. And he says, we'll pay you the same amount. He filled in the blank. We'll pay you the same amount you're making now. Wow. And that wow. was, she was the first person in her career field to make an arrangement of such, she had great impact. She, she could have, I mean, she just didn't know she could have it. She had to get in harmony with it. She had to be on that mm -hmm. vibration and as she did, so it occurred. So those that are is, two stories. <laughs> yeah, that's remarkable. But I also hear that one of the ways that this gets done and dreams come true is by having support. I have found, especially in my life in the early days, that it was easier to accomplish dreams if somebody believed in me almost more than I believed in me. Absolutely, it, Jeff. Yeah. Absolutely. It's key. That yeah. woman, when the woman said, could you believe to me that you could, we could sweep this up and when it's gone, you could get better instead of getting worse. Could you believe that? I didn't believe that, but she right. believed it. And I yes. could tell she believed it. And I uh, borrowed her belief. I yes. borrowed her belief. Well, I think it's one of the secrets to success. Now, we're running out of time, and I always get upset and desperate and impatient <laughs> when we get to this point, because I still want more time with you, and I still have other questions with you, so I'm going to hit some rapid-fire things that are just on my mind. One of them is, when it comes to dreams, are there any limits? Not The only limits are the ones in our minds. Yeah. And and that's what I would figure. But what would you say if somebody is saying, oh, come on, what about the physical limits? What about some sort of science based limits? I mean, what is the counter argument when somebody says, you know, they, they stomp their feet and they say, I can't do this because of these particular limits. And they cite some physical thing. Yeah, well, that's a current reality. That is the current reality that you can't do that because the physical things, but you are more than your current reality. You are more than your current results. Uh, the other is that there are things you can do with what you have. And uh -huh. often people get so focused on what they can't do that they don't even see what they can do. I have a, a client who was a very famous rugby player in Australia, New Zealand, I think. And, um, had a rugby accident. He became paralyzed, mostly from mm. the shoulder down. Mm. I, I have worked with that man, and he, he would love to have his full body back. Unlikely, given science, that that's going to occur. But what he's learned to do in terms of living free in his mind, the creation of a business he created, the impact he's bringing to people, the inspirational speaker he's become, mm. that, okay, there's a, there's a, a, you know, a certain thing. Don't let it be the reason you can't live a life that's fulfilled and expansive and creates all kinds of things that you want. So we get our attention on what we can do and who we can be, and that shifts a lot. Oh, that's huge. That is so huge. You are so inspiring and so refreshing. Let me ask you this. What is a question you were hoping I would ask or hoping somebody in some interview at some time would finally get around to asking you this question and somehow they just keep forgetting or never wow. occurs to them. Ah, oh. mm -mm. 
Well, you already addressed what my biggest dream is right now. Uh, I guess I would like you to ask Mary Jovatelli, why don't we hang out more often? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't have to tempt me at all. I, I've loved the, the few times that I've had with you and your husband. So it would be fantastic, of course, to okay. visit and hang. So you go, you're going for the 1 billion dreams achieved around the world. And you have this offer that is at bti.com slash zero limits. And I've given it to Nick so we can put it on the screen, but it's www.b as in boy, t as in Tom, i as in, you know, idiosyncrasy.com slash zero limits spelled out. And as I understand it, that is a free abundance masterclass where you personally destroy some of the three, I think it's three specific blocks to abundance yeah. and making dreams come true. They're unconscious to most of us, but these are, we, because we're not having the abundance we want in some of the areas yeah. of our life, we know that the cause of that is in us. It's not out there. That is fantastic. Thank you for this amazing gift. We're going to put that up. I want everybody to go get it. If you can't tell, I worship Mary. I love all of her work. I love her books. I love her story. I've learned more about you and your and your background here, of course. And you have these great insights and great ability to articulate the lessons we need to learn. And you so calmly and so wisely sit there and give us the answers we need to hear. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank Everybody you. that's listening, Mary doesn't get paid to be here. I don't get paid to be here. We're doing this for you. And so what I urge you to do is go to the www.bti.com slash zero limits, claim the master class, dive into it, and let that be the beginning of a new journey to making your dreams come true. Mary, do you have any last words? <laughs> no, I just want to acknowledge those who are listening right now and say mm -hmm. that's really an important move you've made is to care, mm -hmm. put some of your intention and energy on your own inner growth. Uh, I want to thank you, Joe, for this television program and all the many ways that it gets distributed, a thousand different ways it goes out with the mm -hmm. message of hope and real transformation. And so I would just say to you, keep coming back because this works when you work it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mary. I love you and I can't wait to see you again. I love you too. <laughs> Thanks. And everybody watching, I'm Dr. Joe Vitale. This is Zero Limits Living. Every week, I bring you inspiration and information to help you make your dreams come true. As Mary just mentioned, the show is being aired on a thousand different platforms, everything from Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire. Uh, you can download the Lux TV app, watch it anywhere, anytime. The audio version is on Spotify and a whole lot of places. I don't even know what all the different ones are. I put up a website, Zero Limits Living T. TV.com, where I'm putting all the episodes just to make it easy for you to go to one place. Zero Limits Living TV.com. I want to thank Lux Media Studios. They're located on Rodeo Drive in uh, Beverly Hills, and it is an exquisite thing that they're doing out there, making things like this, the show possible for everybody. And Candace Barr has believed in me and made this possible. Nick's running the engineering segment of this, and I thank everybody that tunes in. I love you all, and as I like to say, expect miracles. Glutathione is a big word. It's the body's own master antioxidant. It's a scavenger for free radicals, bacteria, and viruses. There are no products in the market with the ingredient NASET. NASET increases the production of glutathione that's in our body already to strengthen and enhance our immune system, elevate sense of well-being, support muscle strength and endurance, cognitive function, and liver support. It helps with increased energy and blood sugar regulation. Get your bottle of GSH Plus from www.salvationnutra.com.